I suppose my great-grandfather was a contradiction in so many ways because uh, although he was very proud of his family connections here and wanted to boast about them to the rest of the members of his family and got my grandfather to bind a small book of the family history for him, at the same time he was a very strong figure in politics. Uh, he, he had worked in Wexford with Pugin, who was a great Staffordshire architect, on the Gothic Revival churches in Wexford and then came to Dublin to work on the Gothic Revival churches in Dublin which brought the family to Dublin and he took over the Guild of Operative Plasters which was for the stuccadors and the interior decorators in Dublin and it was a city guild which elected aldermen to the city council in Dublin but he took over it and turned it into a trade union and then made the union a closed shop for many of his mem family members and his friends and his family connections. So he was the patriarchal figure of the family. And my grandfather, who, who looked after his father in his old age and lived with him when he was a dying man and bound that family book for him, also became very actively involved in trade unionism and in architecture and in uh, the interior decoration of pubs as a stucco door and the interior decoration of, of the great Pugin style churches around Dublin. And when the 1914-1918 uh, war broke out, there was a division in Irish politics between those who saw that this was their country at war and that they had a duty to their country at war and they were led by a great Wexford politician called John Redmond and my, my grandfather and my great-grandfather who would have supported Parnell and Redmond in politics, uh, although they would have been to the left of them. Uh, it seems quite obvious that my gr grandfather would then, uh, even though he was in his 40s, uh, enlist in the British Army, uh, sign up with the Royal Dublin Fusiliers and was shipped out in 1915 to Gallipoli and Suvla Bay and a very small proportion of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers survived uh, the landings at Gallipoli and Suvla Bay and he was taken from there to Thessaloniki and in the winter of 1915 and the beginning of 1916 he was involved in the campaigns from Thessaloniki into Bulgaria and Serbia uh, the conditions there were appalling. Um, he picked up malaria. And in May 1916, just as the Easter Rising in Dublin was uh, reaching its denouement with the execution of the leaders, my grandfather arrived back in Dublin. He'd been married twice. He had two families. Uh, his second wife was a mother to the family of his first wife who died in soon after childbirth and he arrived back to her and only one more child was born who was my own father. So of a large family of children the only child that he had who left descendants on that branch of the family was my father who was conceived because my grandfather had got malaria at Thessaloniki after the Gallipoli landings. Had he not got malaria he might have been sent on to Palestine or to the trenches in France uh, and malaria got worse there was no cure for it and eventually he died when my father was only two he died roaring mad from the conditions of malaria in a very hospital that he had helped to build and when he was buried in a small country churchyard in North County Dublin my grandmother put his date of death on that gravestone as the age that he came back from the war. And the political climate changed in Ireland. His war medals were lost in a family move. Nobody talked about his story and the memory of his story was never handed on to me although I knew who he was because the political climate had changed in Ireland. But I think, having walked around the streets of Thessaloniki and looked at what must have happened to him and thought of a man in his late 40s watching 
boys of 16 and 17 and 18 being killed by the Turks and being killed by the Serbs and being killed by the Bulgarians and more so being killed by the appalling conditions because the Bay of Thessaloniki was a sump watching people die of malaria. How he must have prayed while he was there that this would never happen to his children and his grandchildren. And I hope that I've taken up that vision. Uh, I've been long involved in peace movements and pacifist movements. I've been a lifelong pacifist since I came into this church at the age of 19. Uh, I've been involved with the campaign for nuclear disarmament in England and in Ireland. I think war is an appalling betrayal of what those men went out to Gallipoli and Suvla Bay for. They went out with the promise that this was the war to end all wars. They went out with the promise that this was a war for small nations. They went out with the promise that this was a war for human rights, that the working class would get a better deal when they came home, that women would get the vote, that the slums would be cleared. I think that promise has been betrayed when we look at what has been happening in Iraq, Afghanistan, the antipathy that we have provoked and created and that we have allowed to fester with the so-called Islamic State, with jihadists who resent us rather than seeing us as their liberators. We've betrayed the former colonies. Remember that France and Britain divided up the Middle East between us uh, after, the, after the First World War. I think the vision of the working class who went out to that war was magnificent, but it has been betrayed.